In this video, we're gonna take a look at flexible cables. We're gonna look at the common number of conductors within the cable, as well as their cross-sectional area. We'll look at the outer sheath colors and how they can be used to identify the voltage of the equipment being used. I'll also show you how to strip off that outer sheathing as we lead into our next video, where we look at the BS1363 plug top. Let's bring the camera in and let's take a closer look. Let's first of all look at the conductors themselves. So this here being a three core flex, and obviously flex meaning flexibility, because of this, the fine strands of copper that we've got in our conductors, which is slightly different than some of the other videos that were seen on the channel. This is a class five conductor, and that's worth bearing in mind when we look at what we've already seen on the channel. So our twin and CPC or twin and earth cables have, in this case, a solid copper conductor, and that's class one. And we used stranded cables, but were solid copper stranded, when we did our conduit system and conduit wiring, because again, we said being solid stranded, that had greater flexibility. So this is a class two conductor. So let's recap them. So solid copper, class one, Solid stranded is class two, and then we go for fine stranded, which we've got in flex, which is our class five conductor. Now, if you wanna know more about classes of conductors, I'll leave a link in the description to a video I've made on my other YouTube channel, eFix, where we go through the different classes of conductor. But just for us, we just need to know that these are fine stranded for greater flexibility, and actually it's a class five conductor within our flexible cable. This always used to come up as an exam question when talking about flexible cables and comparing it to the knowledge we've probably acquired when using twin and CPC or twin and earth cables. In this style of cable, we're used to having a reduced size CPC. So 2.5 neutral, 2.5 line, and a 1.5 CPC, because we know it doesn't carry current under normal conditions and only for a maximum of five seconds. That learning has been done in previous videos. When we bring in a flexible cable, and the exam used to ask this, if, for instance, your flexible cable was 2.5, you'd have a 2.5 neutral, a 2.5 line, and what size would the, and they often call it earth for this one, I know that's odd for Gary to be saying earth, but the green and yellow one in here, what size would that be? Now, the problem being, you tend to default back to the learning you had on twin and CPC cables and think maybe it's 1.5. In flexible cables, all the conductors are the same size. So the live conductors and the, in this case, earth conductor, are all the same. So if this was one mil, this would be one mil, and this would be one mil, et cetera, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. So when working with flexible cables, all the conductors are the same size. The common number of conductors in a flexible cable are two core, three core, four core, and five core. I've got a couple in front of me here. So a two core flexible cable with our brown and blue conductors for our line and neutral. A three core cable here, so we're happy with brown, blue, and green and yellow for our conductors. Haven't got the four core, but if we look at the five core, we've got the, obviously, green and yellow for a protective conductor. We've got our phase colors, L1, L2, and L3. We used to brown, black, gray for those line conductors as well as our blue neutral. So the common number of conductors within a flexible cable are two, three, four, and five core flexes. When working in that college environment, we're likely to come across the two and three core flexible cables, especially early on in our study program. The two core being here, we've seen this many times on the channel, are ceiling rows and pendant joined together by a piece of flex. So when I open it up, we can see that actually that is a two core flexible cable uh, we've got in there. So we know that we don't need a protective conductor in this fitting because the fitting itself is fully insulated and therefore doesn't require a protective conductor. And that's where we've been using our two core cable. When we think about three core cable, we're probably thinking about our plug tops. So we've got a plug top here that goes off to an electrical appliance and that could have three cables in it. And we'll look at an, another one in a moment. So as I open this one up, we're used to this sort of situation where when we open it up, we can see our three conductors in there. So we've got our line and our fuse. We've got our neutral and we've got effectively our earth there, which we tend to call it in this sort of environment. And that's got our three cables in. It's what we expect when we open a plug top up and especially when we make one off at college. Let's open up another plug, this one here. Again, looking at the flex from the outside and the size of it, we're probably thinking this is going to be a three core cable. Let's open it and have a look undo this screw and we can access it in there. Actually, that's two core. 
So we've only got our line and our neutral. So you might be thinking, Gaz, that's wrong. That can't be correct because there is no protective conductor in there. We need to look at the appliance itself to work out whether this is correct. So let's put this to one side and have a look at the appliance I've got here. So what I've got here is an electric heater and I've now got to work out whether it needs a earth connection. Well, it's made of plastic, but that can be a red herring. So if you look at your games consoles and TVs, they're obviously metallic in places and sometimes they don't need a protective conductor. So if I turn it round onto the back, I'm looking for this symbol here, a square within a square that is double insulated. If the electrical item has a square within a square, making it double insulated, it doesn't need the earth connection to it. So it doesn't need that green and yellow conductor within the flex. I normally set my students up a take-home task to go around looking at electrical appliances at home to work out whether they are double insulated or not, and to understand the fact that if they are double insulated, they don't need that green and yellow conductor within the flexible cable. The most common sheath color of a flex in a domestic dwelling is black and white. And the exam often asks you when you might use one over another. Well, first of all, aesthetically, sometimes it's more pleasing to see a black lead to a black telly. And obviously this is a white lead to an extension lead. And that's something that we commonly see. However, the exam likes to think about maybe a little bit more about the environment. So where a lead could possibly be used outside, so an extension reel, the likelihood is you'd want the flex to be black because obviously outside it could get dirty and obviously the white one would get dirty very easily. And inside you're likely to choose the white flex. I know a lot of our games consoles and TVs have black flexes to them, but the exam will try and distinguish between the two based on application. So where a lead is possibly being used outside in a domestic dwelling, the extension lead is likely to be black. Where an extension lead is used inside of the house, it's likely to be white. Once you get onto a construction site, the colors of these can change based on the voltage within them. So where you see a yellow lead on a construction site, the voltage is 110. Where you see a blue lead, it's 230. And where you see a red extension lead, it's 400. And for your exam, you're expected to understand the colors that represent those voltages. Yellow's 110, blue's 230, and red is 400 volts. Let's take a look at the construction of a plug top. So you notice that one of the pins is longer than the other two pins. This is your earth pin here and is made of brass as are the other two pins. But you notice on the earth pin, there is no coating around the outside. So this here, this white section on these ones, isn't a change in the material, it is a brass pin, but it's actually wrapped with an insulator on the outside. So first of all, why is the earth pin larger? So that's the first thing. So if we look at a socket outlet here, we can see that the windows here or the shutters are closed preventing you from poking anything in there. So if I was to bring in my screwdriver, I can't actually access what would be the live parts in here. To do so, I need to insert something in here. And as I lever it down, hopefully we can see those windows open. So we can see the fact that now we've opened those connections. Well, I've used a screwdriver. That's not the correct way to do it. So let's pull that back out. So what does open those shutters is the longer earth pin. So when we position the earth pin like so, when we push it into place, it opens those up so we can put in our plug top. So that's the reason why the earth pin is longer in order to open these shutters. It's made of brass. Why is it made of brass? Because it's a good conductive material. It's also hard and machinable. So they've machined it into this position and it doesn't have a reaction to copper. So in other words, you'll talk about dissimilar metals as you go through your course. If I was to screw into a brass terminal, a copper conductor, which I will, because we've seen that obviously these are fine stranded copper, there is no reaction between the two that could cause corrosion. So that's why brass is used. Good conductor, hard, machinable, and the fact that it has no chemical reaction with the copper. If we look now at an older plug top, I'll bring this one in, I've done well to save this one. Very similar design, so as we look at it, we can see the earth pin is larger than the two live connections. Exactly the same as we had before, but hopefully you've subtly noticed the fact there is no sheath around the lower part or insulating material around the lower part of the live pins that we've got on this one here. Now the problem with these is people with very young fingers, small hands, ladies with small hands, gentlemen with small hands, 
with these style of older plug tops, there was an issue. I'll try and demonstrate it to you. So in this position here, as we insert it, we can see the windows are open and we've now made an electrical connection there. Now my fingers can't touch those live parts. However, if you were a child or had smaller hands, you could actually get in and as you put your plug top in, touch those live pins and receive an electric shock because it's conducting electricity at that part. If we bring back our original plug top, our newer style one, we can see when we start to be in that position just there where we would be conducting, all you can see on the live pins is the white, which is obviously the insulating material. So if your fingers were in there touching the pins, you'd actually be touching the insulator and therefore you wouldn't receive electric shock. And there was a big push uh, to replace these some years ago as portable appliance testing was carried out in installations such as in the workplace. And one of the things they did was remove these from service because of that reason. Also, the other reason is you have to check the fuse in here is correct to the appliance. So we'll talk about the fuses next. So I've opened up my BS1363 plug top to reveal the fuse that's in there and the standard size fuse is 13 amps. These are 13 amp plug tops and these are 13 amp socket outlets. So the maximum size of fuse that can go in here is 13 amps. The common sizes are three, five and 13. However, between one and 13, they make a number of fuses, but not every size. They are BS1362 fuses. And if you could see inside here, you've got a metal end cap both sides. It's either a ceramic or glass body, this one being ceramic with obviously the label on it. Sometimes you see a glass tube between them. And believe it or not, there's just a piece of thin copper wire attached between here, which is obviously considerably thinner than the conductors that we've actually used in circuit. So they're considerably thinner. In the event of an overcurrent or a short circuit, that little fuse wire within there will melt. In other words, will blow. So leading into my next video, we'll make a plug top off. Let's look at how we're gonna remove the outer PVC on the flex, the mechanical protection. It would be lovely at your college if you had something like this, a tool that's designed on the ends to be used to strip the outer PVC on flexible cables. So we can bring it in and then we can just simply just go round with it. So we go round and then we can just break that off in order that we get the two sections split away from each other. Now that would be great. Well, we're not gonna get that, are we, at college? So let's snip that one off and uh, maybe that's something you need to buy for yourself. A couple of other methods, when I was on site, I was taught to use a pair of side cutters and I know some colleges do. So I don't know how long it needs to be to go into a plug top at the minute, I'm not worried about that. I just wanna work out getting the PVC off. And you just take your side cutters and it takes a little bit of skill to work out how to do this. You just sort of nibble the outer PVC. So around we go, just nibble in as we go. Once we've got it, we can see it bursts open all the way around. And again, we've broken away the outer PVC using a pair of side cutters. And it wouldn't be Gary if I didn't suggest that when I was teaching, we often used a knife to do this, to learn the skills of how hard to press it. So this was a simple case of scoring, not soaring. So I didn't have it necessarily on the bench. I scored around it and then I just folded it in half and just let it burst its way through. So we can see, depending on how sharp your knife is, I've got a decent knife at the minute and then we can pull that off. And obviously we've separated the two using a knife. So there's different ways in which we can do it. We were taking off the inner PVC around our conductors. Again, would be great if we had something like this. We can see 0.75 to 1.5 and 2.5. We could just simply bring it in, squeeze, and hopefully if we get it in the right place, just pull it off. Just do that again, prove it wasn't a fluke. Look how easy that is to strip off the PVC on the conductors. You can use a knife and also you can use a pair of side cutters. This is hard and I've showed this before in other videos. If I press too hard and I'm gonna strip this one off, I just shorten it. Well, that's no good if I need it a desired length. So it's all about pressing the right amount of strength, but I don't wanna lose any of those fine strands of copper. At class five conductor, you see they're all there. So again, practice is the, the way to do it, isn't it? So snip these two off. If you're using a pair of side cutters, it's the right amount of pressure and just pull away and you can see we haven't lost those. Or we can attempt to use our knife. This takes a little bit of skill because obviously we don't wanna to press too hard because of those fine strands on the copper. We don't wanna cut ourselves. So I've gone round 
trying to feel for it. And then sometimes you can pull it away with your hands. Sometimes you take a pair, just a pair of pliers and you can just pull it off like that. And again, it's just checking that you haven't got any of those coming away. I don't want them all going on the bench. They're all still attached. So we've got a choice of tools that we can use there in order to remove the PVC insulating material around these class five conductors. This is obviously flat, so we can use this style of strippers as well. Watch this, so I put my flex in, just pull it away. I can take off the outside, bring it in again. And I can strip it off of my conductors. So that's incredibly easy. We've seen those before for twin and earth cables, but as this is flat, flat cables, you can also use them on this style of stripper. So that was super easy as well. That leads me into the next thing, which is what I call improving the electrical connection with a ferrule. So these little copper tubes, I know they don't look copper because they're not copper in color, but if I bring in another cable here, they do look a little bit more coppery. So on that one, so that is a copper tube to improve the electrical connection. So when you screw into class five conductors, obviously it can weaken those individual strands. So how can you improve it? And you sometimes see it when you take apart a plug top off appliance that you've bought, that actually there's little tubes on the conductors, they're ferrules. So I'll show you how it works, but I'll leave a link in the description to a video I've done my eFix YouTube channel going all the way through the use of a ferrule and how important it is. So it's a gentle twist. It needs to be longer than we need it. So slightly longer than I need it. Gentle twist, bring in the appropriate size ferrule. And then I've got to hope that I can see this to get it on. So my eyes are not great. So just get that end right, bring in our ferrule. And hopefully that will go down over the conductors, wind it down. You should have a couple of strands, a couple of mil of strands poking out the end. So that tube's on. You bring in your ferrule crimping tool, put it in and we crimp it up. And we can see there we've improved that electrical connection. In other words, now we're almost screwing into what is a solid copper tube rather than those fine stranded ones. And you often see those in the manufacturer's end of a plug top. So check out that video. I'll leave a link for it in the description. So there's plenty of information to take on board there to go alongside your classroom notes when thinking about flexible cables. We can also go on and look at the sheath and its properties and its applications. So if you had an environment where maybe the load is hot, maybe a storage heater or an immersion heater tank, the actual properties of the flex need to be slightly different to deal with that temperature. And the on-site guide is a great point of reference for that. In our next video, we're gonna go on and make the terminations into a plug top. I've got two different styles of plug top. I've got one with a screw, where we simply open it up and go into the terminal, and one where it needs to be wrapped around, which is a little bit more complicated, and I use it as a stretching exercise with my students at Tresham College.